Okay, everyone. So we've just started the recording. Um, so again, welcome to our CSUDH Central Plan virtual tour. Uh, so I'm now going to be handing it off to Kenny Seaton, our energy manager, to go ahead and get started with our festivities. So Kenny, feel free to take it away. All right. Thank you, Ali. Hello, everybody. Um, so when I got asked to do this, normally we do this in person and it takes an hour to go through it. Um, Turns out that I had no problem coming up with an hour of content for this. So hopefully it's not completely boring to all of you. Um, spent some time with, with Scarlett and one of Ellie's interns and we created a 30 minute video. So we're gonna kick this off with the video. Um, if you have any questions or need, want us to pause and talk about something more, just type it into the chat window. I'm gonna stop in a couple spots and talk maybe, although you'll hear me talking through the whole video. And then we'll spend another uh, how much time is left going over some of the major equipment and some of the innovative stuff that we're doing here on the campus. So with that, we're going to kick it off. Well, hi, my name is Kenny Seaton. I am the central plant manager and the energy manager here at Cal State University of Dominguez Hills. Many of you know me, I hope. Um, try and get out and make everybody's life comfortable while saving energy at the same time. We're going to go for a tour through Central Plant uh, today, virtually unfortunately. Uh, many of you know that we do a tour every year. Uh, we've been doing this open house since 2012, inviting the campus and community and faculty and students uh, through the Central Plant. Uh, the last few years since we hired Ellie, uh, we've turned this into a nice trick-or-treat open house tour where decorate a little bit, pass out candy, and, and talk about different things th throughout the tunnel. There's approximately a quarter mile of tunnel that we're going to get a chance to, to walk through. Um, there's also uh, all the piping is through there, all the IT infrastructure, uh, everything flows through there. We're going to talk about the equipment that it takes to make all that work and uh, just what's the infrastructure but behind this campus that most people don't get to see. So thank you and uh, let's go have some fun. So Central Plan is located pretty much center of the campus. For those of you that don't know, it's the building that's just east of the NSNM building uh, or just north of parking lot seven. Uh, within this building is all of our equipment, the chillers, the boilers, water softeners, all that kind of stuff. There's Scarlett, our sustainability assistant coordinator. So here uh, we have our net zero center. Um, we built this with the help of uh, one of the sustainability interns and a grant that was awarded us from the chancellor's office. Um, this building is 100% off the grid, meaning we're not connected to the utility company for electricity. We have solar panels up on the roof. We have batteries inside the building. Um, all the appliances that you see, the, the ceiling fans, we have a TV monitor so that we can teach classes out here. We have a drinking fountain that produces water from the air. Um, we have electric meters or uh, gauges on all of the outlets and the plugs so that if uh, the sustainability group wanted to teach a class or a teacher wanted to teach a class over here, we can show them just how much electricity does it take for a coffee pot or for these ceiling fans or our drinking fountain machines. So we kind of built this out as an educational center. Um, we have sustainability, we talk about composting, um, we talk about recycling, um, all of that stuff. So here we have our one of the carts that the sustainability group uses. We actually originally designed this for the farm so that they could carry the food produce and stuff back and forth around the campus. Um, it was an old cart that wasn't used anymore. We kind of put it back together and rebuilt it. We put a solar panel on top of it so that this cart never really has to get plugged in. Um, so everywhere it goes, the students are able to educate everybody on uh, another way of how we can save energy. Um, we, we made our nice little sign. We have five carts like this on campus that we're able to use for, for different events and stuff. Um, for the first year, the farmer's market, they didn't have power for one of their booths. So rather than have them fire up a gas generator for their stuff, uh, I believe it was the vendor that was doing the smoothies and, and cappuccinos and stuff. Not only can we charge the batteries with the solar panel, but we're able to build, we call this the little power brick. And so this power brick plugs into the cart. 
and we have mobile generator now, so powered by the sun. So this produces the 110 volts that everybody's used to for their appliances. Uh, we have two smaller carts that we have a power brick for them also. So, you know, every year at Earth Day, we, we have the popcorn machine that we run off of this thing that a lot of you have seen. Cooking demonstrations that the sustainability group has done when they need to run the hot plates and all that kind of stuff, they're able to power that stuff with this. So we don't have these extension cords running all over the place. We're not using the electricity. We're showing how sustainable, how things can be done differently. So CSUDH, in a sense, is kind of like this mini city. It takes a lot of power. Um, the power for your house comes from the poles and it just comes in at the correct voltage that you need, 110 volts, 120 volts. Um, here, the power from the utility company comes in to this transformer here at 16,000 volts. And then we transformer that down to 12,000 volts. And then from there, we run it all through the we're going to get a couple more shots of that as we go through this tour. How we cool the buildings is critical to also how much water we pump to the building. Right? So we have, to, we have to pump the correct flow of water. If we pump too much water, then that water is not going to be in the area long enough to absorb all that heat. If we don't pump enough water, then not enough cooling to cool down the space. So the, the time, the gallons per minute, all of that is really critical. We have to monitor all that. Alright, so now we're going to go down into the tunnels. Um, again, we have about a quarter mile of tunnel. We'll stop and we'll talk about some stuff. We'll look at a small air handler, we'll look at a large air handler, we'll look at a fan wall air handler, we'll get to walk inside and, and look at this stuff. Um, let's, let's go for a nice walk through the tunnels. So you'll notice that it's nice and dark in there. We keep the lights off unless somebody's down there working. We saw the lights probably got brighter on the video just a minute ago. Um, come in. So we put the same enlightened technology that we have in Welch Hall, the Court Hall. Um, it's going to be SBS, NSNM. You've seen it in some of the spaces. When you walk down the hallways, the lights get brighter. Uh, some of you are in some of the classes that have the new lighting technology where the teacher's able to push a button and just the lights over the video monitor screen go off as opposed to back in the day they had switches and it didn't do anything except turn off a light here and here and here. So we're starting to upgrade to the, to the correct lighting schemes. Um, by doing that, we're putting LED lights in, which is more than half of what you know the normal lights are using. And then we're able to control that setting so that each individual person can have the lights adjusted to exactly what they want. Um, we're seeing anywhere from 50 to 70% energy savings by, by putting these lights in. Also now with COVID, because there's so many spaces that are empty, the lights are off. And so a lot of you probably have been here during night classes and walked by SPS. And how many times have you walked by in the evening and you see just all these classrooms with the lights on and nobody in there? And so by implementing this, this technology, now if you were to walk by the new science building, for instance, you'll see that all the lights are off when nobody's in there. And it's really, for me as an energy manager, it's kind of exciting to me because I love seeing the lights off and nobody's there. So let's let's walk through the tunnel a little bit. Normally, when we were, when we do our in-person tour, this is kind of the first stop. Uh, we have this little map here. You are here. So we came down a set of stairs uh, right here, and behind Scarlet there, there's a branch of tunnel that goes to the SPS building. We're not going to go down there. Uh, but that that has the electrical infrastructure. It has hot water. Has cold water. Has uh, IT, all that stuff, so then it comes up from underneath the building. Uh, we're going to walk through the NSM building, we're going to go through the South Library, we're going to go all the way to La Court Hall. Um, if you look above me, you can see we have these big pipes. So um, the darker the orange, the hotter the water. So we can tell that that bright orange one is the water going out to the campus. The hot water goes out to the campus. It gives up its heat, comes back cooler, comes back with this yellowish color one. Over here, these aluminum jacketed ones, these are the chilled water. The chilled water pipes, if you'll notice, are much larger than the hot water pipe. So if I was doing this in person, I would ask you why, and you know, we, we have this QA, we can't do that now. Um, there's, if you think about boiling water, there's a lot more energy in that water when it gets really hot. And so we're able to compress that and hot water pipes are smaller than chill water pipes. So to get the same tonnage or BTUs out of it, we've got to have much bigger pipes. 
Um, you'll see in places where these pipes were, we started painting pipes, and you'll see the dark and light blue color scheme. Um, above us over here, we have our yellow pipe is the uh, gas line that, uh, that runs out throughout the campus. Uh, the blue line is compressed air. The gray line is our vacuum lines. So that way we know what those pipes are. We know when there's a problem, we have to troubleshoot. You know, it's, it's much easier finding the color pipe because we've mapped it out beforehand. Otherwise, all those pipes would be this ugly pipe color and you'd have to follow it from far away. So we've been trying to upgrade that stuff. These trays here, this is our IT tray. So we have some fiber optics, we have some cables and stuff. This connects all the campus buildings. So if you think about the fact that Welch Hall and the library are the hubs of uh, technology and Wi-Fi and all that stuff, it still has to get out to all those buildings. Not everything is wireless. Um, a lot of that stuff is hardwired for the computers, for the voice over IP, all that stuff. And so this is one of the paths that we're able to get throughout the different buildings. We're blessed that we have a tunnel system. Um, the, our forefathers, our, our foremothers, right? Who, whoever designed this campus in, in the late 60s uh, thought it out. So if we didn't have a tunnel, all this stuff would be buried, right? And everywhere you go where there's this much buried stuff from the 70s, it's broken many times because Mother Nature doesn't like you to bury stuff in her, right? So she eats it. And so we're, we're in good shape here. We have better insulation value. We are able to do maintenance. We're able to have these fun tours. So let's move through a little bit. So regardless of what you've heard, they're all rumors. There's no dead bodies buried down here. There's, there's no zombies. There's nothing really fun like that. So just an empty tunnel with pipes. Although there was a video, a movie filmed, I should have had that for our stuff uh, on this campus with snakes and everything down in this tunnel, I think. So we're underneath the science building right now. Uh, this is one of the mechanical rooms. Um, we're in the middle of, a, of a, a fun project, so that's why you can see the parts and tools and boxes everywhere. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit in a different air handle, we'll be able to see that. If you think about, uh, in the early morning, your car has that, that the dew on it, right? That's the condensate. And so when we take that cold water and we run it through the air handlers, we create a lot of condensate in the excess of approximately 1 million gallons a year. And so normally, the condensate just runs down right down the drain. And so we're in the middle of doing a project where we're going to collect all of that condensate and we're going to pump it back to the cooling tower um, where we use 20,000 gallons a day. So. Uh, you see the big tank, we're going to collect the water, we're going to take it out of all of the air handlers throughout the tunnel and pipe it all back, so it's kind of a, a big project. Behind me here is an air handler. Um, it's a little harder to see on the video. Uh, there's a big fan in there. If you're familiar with the NSNM building where the faculty are um, behind the north of the uh, main building, right, that long T section. This, this air conditioning unit supplies just that. It has its own air conditioner because we're able to circulate the air because the building is separated from the science building. We're going to go in and, and, and look at the air handler for the science building. Science buildings aren't able to recirculate the air. So the science buildings are the most inefficient building to run, right, because we have to take whatever the temperature air is outside, for instance, Yesterday, today, if we get above 100 degrees, we have to take that 100 degree air and we have to cool it down to 55 degrees. It takes a lot of chilled water to do that. And then we circulate it throughout the rooms and the, and the building, and then we blow it out the exhaust. Whereas all other air conditioning units, we're able to cool down that air to the 55. We send it out through the building. It comes back at maybe 75 degrees. And we, and we circulate that 75, we bring some fresh air from outside to, to make sure that the CO2 levels are correct, just a little bit, like 15%. And now we're only having to cool that 75 degree air down to 55 as opposed to that 100 degree air. And so it's a lot more efficient, it doesn't use as much chill water, as much energy from the chillers, as much pumping horsepower to pump that water throughout the campus. Um, so now we're gonna go look at a different air handler. 
we've come a long way from this antiquated system. We now have Wi-Fi throughout the tunnel. Uh, we're able to bring our laptops, our, our phones, and we can connect to all the equipment. So now we can come down here and, and correct things on our own without relying on somebody that's a block away to, to adjust it for us. Talk about the science building, how the science building needs 100% outside air. Um, it needs a very large fan and it needs full air in all the time. For those of you that are familiar with the, with the campus, if you just south of the NSNM building, right in the middle, there's this thing that looks like uh, maybe a bell tower or, or just this tower with louvers on it. That's actually the air intake for the for the science for the old science building. Um, we're gonna go in there. We've nicknamed this air handler Big Bertha because it's the biggest air handler that we have, and you'll see why. So the fan that I'm gonna show you, this is a 150 horsepower fan. Um, it supplies all the air for the science building. And uh, there's a lot of pressure when you open the door because it's sucking air in, trying to get more air. So if you look in here, we see the giant fan. On the left-hand side over here, we see the coils. We see all the water is coming off of those because of the humidity in the air. And as we dry out the air, by getting cold, all that water drops out. See the floor drain has just so much water flowing through it right now. All that water is just going down the drain. So our plan is we're we're almost there. We're gonna pipe all that water back and save that. And like I said, we think it's about a, a million gallons. If you look at the coil bank one more time, if you want to understand how do we how do we actually make cold air, right? So if you think about the radiator on your Car. That's why I like to use that as an example. So the radiator in your car, you have the water running through the radiator, it runs through the engine, you're moving down the road, you have a fan, the fan is pulling air across that. What it's really doing is taking the heat from the engine and getting rid of it. So we talk about we move the heat, we're taking the heat from the classrooms or your office space and we're moving it somewhere else. So on your car it's the hot, the hot water that's created from the engine block. Here we're we're creating our own cold water. We're filling up these radiators or coils with cold water. We're blowing air through that, and we're getting that cold air, and we're able to push that then through all the ductwork uh, throughout the campus. If we wanted to do it for heating, uh, we have these reheat coils, and we, we pump the hot water through the coil, we blow air through it, hot air comes out the other side. Uh, some of you might be old enough to remember the heat waves, or maybe you're doing it now when you take your floor fan you take a wet cloth and you drop it over the front of that so that it kind of feels like you're moving a little bit of cool air. Kind of that, that principle. So because we're one story below ground, we still need to bring fresh air in for, for us and for the equipment. So one of the ways we do that is we have some exhaust fans in certain places, uh, our intake fans that, that are able to exhaust or bring fresh air into the space. Um, if you were here in person, we'd play this little game, where am I now? Um, so we put a picture on the wall, so if Scarlett, you could zoom in on that. So I'll give you guys a minute to guess where do you think we're at? All right, so this is that space. Anybody know where we're at? There we go. Good job. Space, uh, you got some vending machines over here, I think, and you got the library and the science building in, be in between those two. Now, today, there's a stainless steel plate that looks like a solid, uh, Looks like a spaghetti strainer, right? This flat plate with all these little holes that they put on there so the squirrels can't come in, I think. Um, but that's connected to this ductwork right now. So that's where we're at. We're actually underneath uh, that particular spot. So now we're underneath the North Library. Um, it was the original library to the campus. It has four air handlers. Uh, there are two right here next to each other. There's another one around the corner that you have to duck down and kind of almost crawl in one section to get to. And then up on the uh, top floor, there's another air handler. So 
with it a lot like the same one we saw before. Big fan. So that big fan is connected to ductwork. It's pulling air through the radiator coils that have the cold water running through them and we're supplying cold air to the space. If you look on the right, you see the filters. So we bring the air back from the building, back to the filters. Talk about that outside air that we want. Uh, we need to bring 15% about of outside air in. So, so we have an outside set of loopers. Because we're in the tunnel system, it's still outside. We're gonna walk by another section where you can see and, and it'll be another one of those games, where are you now? Where we're bringing air in through the tunnel so that we can have some fresh air. You see these louvers aren't pinched off all the way. So this, this big thing, we're measuring the amount of air. And so we're mixing this outside air that may be a little bit warmer with the building return air, passing it back through the filters, cooling it back down to the 55, 57 degrees, and then blowing it into the space. Okay, so this is our, our game, where are you at now? Um, remember I said we had to bring fresh air into the tunnel, but we also needed to find a place for my 15% fresh air. So we have this wall, we have some filter media on it, so we're trying not to pull as much dust in as we can. We come out here and we look up. So if you look closely, you'll see the yellow chains and you'll see this grid. And so again, where are you now? You've probably, some of you have walked over this hundreds of times and wondered, just what is that for? Is that for water or what? So typically, if you go to any big building or stuff like that, if you see these big grills in the ground, they're for the air. Um, there's a parking lot right to your left and uh, um, we're on the west side of the library. Um, the court hall is, farther that way one of the one of the things to, to pay attention to that you think about is if this is close to a parking lot and there's an event and a bus decides to park there and the bus driver sits in their bus and idles with a diesel engine running then we get complaints in the building because it smells like fuel or gas or diesel fuel or whatever well that's because this thing's sucking air right into the building Pipes have been overhead, you know, we still have all our pipes. Um, if, if you were in person, I, you know, you could touch the pipe and you could feel that one of them is warmer than the other, one of them is cooler than the other. So no, no matter how well we insulate it, we're still, there's a lot of energy there that's trying to escape. So we want to keep that, that stuff insulated as good as possible because we don't want that energy to be heating up or cooling this space. We want it into your classrooms and offices. And so that's the purpose of all this insulation. The other purpose of that, as you may have seen in the videos we were walking down, there was like one place where water was dripping. Well, that water was dripping is because it's so hot outside and we're drying that out and the insulation in that spot is not that good and the oxygen, there's air around the pipe. So the in this insulation also keeps the air from getting around that, which keeps it from sweating or condensating and dripping on the floor. And so it's critical that we keep that stuff covered up. Alright, so we're, we're at the court hall now. We're going to walk in and look at a fan wall. Um, this, is, this is kind of really cool because it's, it's a, we're able to explain really how the outside air economizer and all this stuff works. Right now we're standing in the air street room building. The fan wall in the CP is ladders. Um, it's pulling the air from the building. So, on the other side of the wall, we can't see it. There's another fan wall identical to that that pushes air into the building. Pushes the air into the building, then the return air brings it back. Right now, because of the controls, it looks like this building is, is doing 100% economizer mode. So we're pulling the air back from the building. We're pushing it out this set of loopers here. And then we're pushing it out with the, the 
those grills in the, in the roof that, that we walk by. Just, just like the set that we looked at before. Now these are behind the Laporte Mall building. So if anybody's done any pottery or any of the artistic classes out there, they have that patio area up back. On this side, you can see we have another set. Pulling fresh air in from outside. We have our louvers open, we pull them through the filters, we clean the air, and then on the other side it goes through the, the radiator coils or the cooling coils, and we send cool air to the building. Um, we've got some of the some of the buildings we've got them set, you know, because of COVID we want to bring more fresh air in, and so this building is still in that 100% fresh air mode. Here's the other side of the filters, and that air blows through the coil. And on the other side of the coil, we have another set of fans, and that's the fans that are pushing the, the, the water through the building. And we can see the water that's just running down the drain. Uh, we're in the process of collecting it. It'll be collected in a unit like this. Same kind of the piping and stuff. Let it get piped back to a bigger tank, and then we just keep going. The beauty of the fan walls is that it's, if, if you remember, like Big Bertha or the one that we looked up for the library, that fan motor breaks, the whole building, that, that section is offline and it's heavy and it's a lot of work and it takes time to get a 150 horsepower motor, 100 horsepower motor. Um, instead here we have just a bunch of little 7 horsepower motors and if one of these were to fail, we'd have plenty of time to order a new one, get it in place and be able to change it out without shutting the building down. This tunnel um, leads to the gym and the original campus logo before we went to the bold letters. So I'm going to show you what the original was. So does anybody remember this logo not too long ago? And if you look at the picture on the right and we do this. was this circle with these like half circle uh, diagrams in it. And the story is that they had a contest to come up with the, uh, with that logo. And it was a facilities person who thought that this image with the way the light shines, and that's how they came up with that image. So if you go do some research and look at the original logo, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, and if you wanna have a fun walk, we'll show you what this tunnel looks like. When it rains, we get to get we can get to the gymnasium through the tunnel. So now we're underneath the gymnasium. Got a big tank here for the hot water for the showers and stuff. We got some air handlers here, here. We got the filtration system for the swimming pool, chlorinator. Just a big, nice, empty space that my phase change technology might be able to do really well at. So, I'm going to talk about how everything's connected, right? So, the tunnel system connects all the buildings, the piping connects all of that. We'll go all the way back to Central Plant. We play one of those games where are you now? So, anybody that's used the swimming pool, if you go out the, the back doors of the locker room, there's that. Uh, chain linked off area. That's where we're at. So that ends our tunnel tour. So let's go back to the civilization. Okay, so we talked a lot about the chilled water. We talked a little bit about the hot water. So for the hot water, we have boilers. Back in the day, there were boilers. They made steam. Take a look at 
So yes, we're fast forwarding to a couple sections. Behind me are the eight new, at the same time we got the cooling, uh, the, the chillers. Uh, last year we got these new boilers. So each one of these is 2 million BTUs. Um, they're able to stage up and down how they want to run, you know, based on the load. So that, that 2 million BTUs, to put that in, in uh, context, the water heater at your house is probably 30 to 40,000 BTUs. Uh, that means that one of these 2 million BTU boilers is about 57 times bigger um, or more capacity than the one at your house, just to put it in context. Um, like I said, they, they used to be boilers and, and they created steam and then went through a heat exchanger to create hot water. Now they're just really efficient, large hot water heaters. Before that, we had one giant boiler that um, the whole thing ran whether we needed a giant load or not that much load. So now this is way more energy efficient. Um, if you look at old movies, you watch movies and they show the lovely mechanical room or you know, they got this giant boiler vessel um, uh, to create heat back east that's more popular. Um, now we're able to get small contained, um, much more energy efficient. But saying that, my goal is realistically I'm gonna tell everybody my goal is to stop burning gas on this campus so we use 65 percent less gas this year than we did a year and a half ago so we're already doing a great job right being able to get rid of that absorption chill, uh, absorption chill. these these boilers compared to the old one are you know 50 percent more efficient than that old one it's, it's great but at the same time why are we still burning gas so a project that we're hopefully uh, this next week coming up we're going to put together is we're going to do a solar thermal heating system. Um, we're going to take the, the energy from the sun, we're going to heat up these glass tubes that have these copper pipes in them. The, the pipes are there, we have parts kind of spread out here because we're gearing up just a few days away. Um, and we're going to run water through that, we're going to absorb the heat from the sun, and then we're going to take that and put it back into the loop. By doing that, we'll be able to take, take a boiler offline. Um, this is going to be the proof of concept, the pilot. If it works, then we'll expand it, find more places to put it. Um, that goes into the phase change technology that I hinted at when we were down in the tunnel. We can then put these three foot by four foot pods down in the tunnel. And uh, in the daytime, when we don't need that much heat, we can store that into those pods. And then at nighttime, when the sun goes down, then we take the heat back out and we're able to circulate through the loop. That's the, that's the goal, and that's what every day I'm talking to different people, uh, grants, Department of Energy, different people to, to do this pilot project here so that we can be the first CSU in the system uh, that doesn't work against. All right, so that's our, hopefully that didn't put anybody to sleep. It looks like we still have most of the people. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about the equipment that uh, in, inside the plant. So um, if you came on this tour um, last year, year, bef year before last, um, we used to create chilled water with gas. Um, it was, they were called direct gas fired absorption chillers. Um, nowadays, the only place that that's really realistic to do is if you have um, something called cogen where, where you create electricity and you have waste heat and the waste heat runs absorption chiller. But back when we did it, we were burning gas to do it. Gas was really cheap. Nobody really knew just how bad gas was for the greenhouse gas. And so it worked. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to upgrade the, the campus last year uh, when the new science building was being uh, put together. Um, and we went to electric chillers. So what that did was we were worried that we were gonna increase the electricity usage, but technology has come so far that these new electric chillers um, are so efficient that our electric usage really only went up about 7%, um, whereas our gas usage went down probably better than 65%. Um, the, uh, 
so we're we're saving a ton of gas and like i said if if things work out you know eventually i hope to stop burning gas um everything that we put in has really state-of-the-art advanced controls that we're able to pull those up and look at those from from anywhere we go for instance correctly so we use our, our medicine system here if anybody has taken the tours before we would be in our control room showing you off this kind of stuff um, we have controls so that we can see everything so we have three chillers in, in the central plant right now we're running one of those chillers we're creating 44 degree water and we're sending that out to the campus uh, to all the buildings and we're collecting the heat from those buildings and we're coming back at 52 degrees. Um, we then, it's a loop and it goes back to 44 degrees. We can see we're doing 450 tons of, of cooling. Um, each one of these chillers is good for up to a thousand tons. So we're on a nice cool day like this. It's not that bad. Um, if in the video, if you noticed, I was saying on a hot day like this, well, we did this video two or three weeks ago and it was really hot when we did that. So um we can see the pumps that are pumping the water throughout the campus um we're pumping at about a thousand gallons of water throughout you know more than a quarter mile of, of tunnel but you know much more pipe than that to get to the farthest buildings and stuff hey kenny um, actually on yes. the topic of the tunnels we did get a question on that um so the question was is this tunnel underneath all buildings how big is it so the tunnel is as big as you saw right so we could get a pallet jack down there and uh you know put stuff down there and and get it down there um it's about a quarter mile it runs from central plant it goes underneath the old science building goes underneath the um, north library goes underneath the court hall um, it also then branches off to sbs and then there's kind of a utility tunnel that branches off to the student union uh welch hall and the health center not something that a person will you could crawl i think but none of us would ever do it. Um, so it's protected from other nature is, is the big deal about that. Um, let's see. So, all right, so we have the, um, the controls that, that we can see everything. Um, yep. The other part of that is we can see all the buildings also. So for instance, this is a screen, this is a shot, live shot of the fourth floor of Welch Hall. Um, it's, the green zones are probably occupied by people. The gray ones are unoccupied. Um, it's interesting to see that on the north side of the building, we're not really doing any cooling over there, but the rooms are maintaining 71 or so, 72 degrees without any heating or cooling. Whereas on the south side of the building where we're getting more sun, the zones that don't have any people in them get to 74, 77, 80, 76, 77. And so um, that pays a, a big part in how do, we, how do we control those zones? How far out of whack do we let them get uh, before we make sure that we you know, cool them down again so that when people come in, it's not too hot. Uh, with COVID, it's, a, it's just this kind of a balancing act right now because we don't want to cool off the entire building when, when there's only a handful of, of, of people here and there. So we talked about the chillers. Um, we talked about the boilers a little bit. Um, some pictures of equipment we have. So we have some very large pumps that we have that we use to pump the water uh, throughout the campus. Um, part of that video we talked about you know how critical it is that, that we pump water at the correct speed, the right GPM throughout the buildings. Um, if, if you think about the, the reason that water is there is to either collect heat or to, to give up heat, right? So chill water, its purpose is to collect the heat from the building. We absorb the heat out of the space is really what's happening. Um, after we, we absorb that heat, we bring it back to the chillers. So, so the dark blue is our chilled water going out. The light blue is coming back. And then we have these green ones. So, so these are the cooling tower and, and it, was, it was too loud out there to kind of video that. So we didn't really talk about that too much on the video, but let's look at our cooling tower. 
So the cooling tower's purpose is to then take that heat that we absorb from the buildings and, and get rid of it. Um, some people think, well, the chiller, you know, it gets rid of the heat. It doesn't, it just cools the water down, but we have to get rid of the heat. Um, at your house, if you have an air condition, if you have air conditioning at your house, whether it's a window unit or whether it's central air, um, if it's central air, there's gonna be this loud unit that's, you know, probably behind your house. Um, when your air conditioning is running, it's dissipating hot air. Um, when your window unit is running, it's blowing cold air in and it's blowing hot air out. So that hot air is getting out. So that's, that's called air cooled, right? So the air takes that heat and cools it off. So here we're water cooled. So what happens is we have these big green pipes that run into the chiller, absorb the heat, they take that water and they run it into these cooling towers. These cooling towers are nothing more than a way of blowing air across the water. At the very top of this cooling tower, there's a whole bunch of um, nozzles, like sprinkler nozzles upside down. And so we sprinkle the water into the cooling tower. Then inside the cooling tower, there's what's called fill media. And if you imagine a giant Lego waffle um, and a whole bunch of them stacked up. So there's all these nooks and crannies. So the water flows through the nooks and crannies and every time it flows through there, like water running down a, 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 a babbling brook, right? With rocks in it, the water spreads out and goes different directions. When it does that, the water gets smaller. Every time the water, those particles get smaller, there's more surface area around them. And then we take at the bottom, there's eight large fans um, underneath each of these three towers that blows air up through that. This makes a draft and the heat dissipates. You've probably all seen these. Um, every major building, every hospital, every high rise building has probably got one or two of these. You'll see them on the roof or on the side of the building in a parking lot. Um, in the early morning, you'll, you'll see, it looks like smoke is coming off the top of them. It's really just condensate because it's that, that uh, warm water that's just evaporating off the top. Um, so what's happening is that's, while you're yep. on the topic of cooling, we did have a question come in regarding that. Um, so the yep. question is, how do you know how many people are in a given building at any given time um, so that you know which ones to cool? So I'll let you feel that. All right, so let's, let, let me get to that in one second. I'll answer that question after we talk about the cooling tower. So the cooling tower, um, it evaporates a lot of water. So we're always looking for, you know, how do we save water? Um, there are certain things that you just, no matter how good you are, you, you have to use a lot of water. Um, so normally if I was in person, it'd be easier. It's like, how many gallons of water a day does anybody think that we evaporate off the top of these large stacks? So anybody guess in my chat window? Let's see if there's any guesses at all. Let's see if Scarlett remembers. I'll put somebody on the spot here. No guesses. 50,000. Yes. I, yep. So Brittany's heard this before. Um, ignore this. Don't log out on me. So when we were absorption chillers, we were 50,000 gallons because the absorption chiller, remember, it burnt gas. So it, it had its own heat on top of the heat that it took out of the building. So it had a lot more heat to get rid of. So now that we're electric, um, on a hot day, we are 4,307 gallons. No, that's on a cold day, sorry. So again, we meter everything so we know how things are going. So 26,000 gallons a day. Um, but Brittany, you're right. That's what it used to be, um, about 50,000 on a, on a nice hot day. So depending on the weather, right, that's how much heat we're having to get rid of. So on a hot day, we're 26,000. Um, on a nice cold day, we're 4,000, 5,000. Um, and so not only did we save ginormous amounts of greenhouse gas by switching to these electric ones, but we also saved a bunch of water. And so these are all commodities that resources that, you know, we can't be afford, we can't afford to waste. All right, so how do we know if somebody's in a space? So we talked about the, the enlighted technology in the tunnels a little bit so that the lights are not on when people are not there.
So Welch Hall, we've, we've done this to, um, we're about to do it to SPS. Um, we've done it to the new science building. We have some zones here and there. The court hall just got finished. Um, so every light fixture, we're putting this occupancy sensor on there. We are then able to tell if somebody is in the space or not. Um, if nobody's in the space, we know that it's safe to, to not Yes, motion sensors. Yep, that's all they are. They're not cameras, they're, they're just motion sensors. Um, so for instance, this space here, A308, right? So we have one, two, three, four, eight, 12 motion sensors in that space. We tie those motion sensors all together as one group. And now we're able to get a, a signal from, from this enlightened software back to the campus building automation system. And it says, hey, nobody's in that space it's unoccupied and by doing that we're able to save energy um, before that uh, this space would be cooled to roughly 72 degrees from six in the morning until 10 at night because that's when we teach classes here on this campus so as we're able to implement this um, we're able to see that uh, we don't need to cool all those spaces for example if we look at the occupancy status for this floor these would have been green if, if somebody was in them. Um, so you can see all the little human body torsos, those are occupied. So they're not occupied, right? We're showing that nobody's in this space. Um, so that's how we're able to control that. One of the other technologies that we have on this campus that, that we were kind of uh, the leaders in is battery storage. So people have heard about battery storage, right? Solar is great. Um, Solar is, you know, creates free electricity from, from the sun. But what happens at nighttime? Or what happens um, if, if you think about, let's just, just the city of Carson, right? Let's say we all got our electricity from the same person and everybody has solar on their rooftops. Um, but then all of a sudden there's just, the, the wind picks up and clouds blow in and it blocks all the solar. Um, all of a sudden the electricity disappears and our energy provider has to start up a uh, gas-fired or coal-fired generator, right, to, to make up that difference. And he's got to have it coming on really fast because there's no time to react, right? You don't want to have a brownout or a blackout or something, which means that those generators are probably running all the time in standby mode or backup. Well, if we were to put batteries in, then if the sun went away, the battery could kick in. So on our campus, we have a one megawatt, four hour battery. Um, what that means is that I can supply a megawatt of power for four hours. Um, this campus demand is two megawatts. Um, and that's because there's not a lot of us here and we're turning down things when nobody's here. Uh, normally, this time of year with the new electric chillers, we would be closer to uh, between three and a half and four megawatts. Um, the battery is keeping us at, at two megawatts. So if, if we look on this chart here, the green is what we're using from Edison. And the peach color is the battery. So if we didn't have the battery, this would all be green. We would, we would get that much more from Edison. Um, it doesn't, it, the batteries don't make us use less electricity. The batteries make it so that we don't use as high a peak amount when everybody else needs it, right? Um, so the battery is able to charge up. Over here, this, this uh, different green with the lines is the battery charging back up. The battery will charge up only to this 2.6 megawatts. Um, and if we zoom in a little bit, this doesn't crash. So the batteries are keeping us here at 2.055 utility demand. But then right at four o'clock, so everybody except for residential right now, you pay for the worst, the most amount of electricity you use at one time, like wattage instead of kilowatts. So you get billed for kilowatts, that's how much you use total in the in the month, but that's based on how long you use a certain amount of watts. So a 100 watt bulb burning for four hours or a 400 watt bulb burning for one hours is the same amount of electricity. 
So we're still going to use the, the, the kilowatt hours, but at that one moment in time, we're not going to peak so high. And we get charged a lot of money for what that peak is. So we get our normal peak. And then at four o'clock, we pay even more for, for our peak. So the battery is able to drop us down. And then on certain days, there might be a demand response event. And maybe there wasn't enough electricity, super hot day, everybody's using it, the, the rolling brownouts that you know we just experienced like August 18th and stuff where we were worried about is the power gonna go out on us. Um, so we would reduce even more then. So if you look at this point in time right here, uh, if you look uh, in the, the red and that little pop-up stem reduction is 1060. So that's a megawatt of power that it's reducing. Um, on top of that megawatt of power, um, the campus was probably reducing about 400. And so normally, you know, we would have been right around here and, and fallen off. And so uh, between the battery and between the, the, the campus, you know, we can change some of the the chiller temperature or how fast we pump that water, maybe we slow it down, maybe we can slow down an air handler because we see that, you know, the building is, is running okay. So for a couple hours, we're able to reduce that stuff. Um, so that's what our battery's for. Um, let's talk about energy savings a little bit. Uh, so this talks about our makeup water. So you can see um, how we're at, uh, this is from a year ago, right? January of 2018. Um, this is where, Brittany, you were right. We used to use like 50,000 gallons on a nice hot day and ignore this spike here. That was a problem, you know? Now we're at that uh, 20, 10, 10 to 20 to 30,000 gallons on a hot day. So we have that. This talks about and natural gas usage, I said we reduced by 65%. So this is 2017 January. We used to use, what's that, 3,000 therms a day. Um, or then we got rid of it somewhere in here. And now we're all the way down here at um, 390. So we're getting better and better and better. Same thing on the electricity. We thought that our electricity usage would go way up because we put in these giant electric chillers, but because of their efficiency, um, this is where our electric used to be. And if you look, uh, COVID kind of hit right about here. So yeah, we dropped down, but right in here, we're not that much worse on our peak than, than we used to be. And so the efficiency has come so far and, and that and the demand response and the efficiencies that we've created in the buildings over the last so many years is, is helping us there. One of uh, a big project that we did, so Welch Hall, um, we put in, so you asked about the occupancy sensors. So here's what happens with those occupancy sensors. Um, in, so this is January, 2019, to now, um, we used to use 25,000 kilowatts, kilowatt hours. Um, and then we started doing LED lights and then we started putting controls into them and the electricity went way down. But not just did the electricity go down, the chill water that we, that we pumped to that building also went down. So we used to be up here at 60,000 gallons per minute all the time. And now we're down here at, at 7,000. And so, yes, a lot of that's because of COVID, right? We don't have as many people, but it's also because we're only cooling the spaces that have people. And so this is one building that we're able to make this uh, drastic change in. So imagine as we get the rest of the buildings uh, commissioned, tuned up and, and brought into the system. If we look at the, the cost, um, this is uh, per month, right? So $2,000 a month just for that one building. And now we come over here and we're like, you know, $1,500, $1,600 a month. And so um, we're saving drastic, drastic amounts of uh, electricity, uh, gas, all, all that stuff. And that 
is about it. Uh, another technology we have is we have uh, a lot of buildings, some of the older buildings have package air conditioning units. They're not brought into the central plant. Um, so it used to be they had a thermostat that would run again from you know six in the morning till 10 at night, six days a week. Um, we've been able to remote that. So kind of like if you have a uh, Ecobee or a Nest thermostat on your house where you could you know talk to it and see what's going on. So we're able to see what's going on. We're able to create schedules. So this is SAC 2. Um, we can see that you know a lot of these systems are off now and we're able to, to schedule that. But if we have people, we're able to uh, adjust those systems so that they work. All right. So Kenny, you uh, tricked me a little bit and faked me out on that last section. So sorry for jumping in early, but um, I did want to pay attention to the time since I know that some people probably have hard two o'clock commitments. Um, so for the purposes of the recording, I'm going to end that now. So for online audiences, thanks for tuning in. Um, so I will go ahead and pause the or stop the recording.